Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and get us going here. So welcome everyone to the third seminar in this academic year's GW Biomedical Cross Disciplinary Seminar Series. The goal of which is to provide networking and collaboration in translational health among researchers, healthcare providers, and policymakers from different disciplines to shift the paradigm from seeking a cure to developing a strategy of prevention. This year, the GW Office of Integrative Medicine and Health has partnered with the Resiliency and Wellbeing Center and the Department of Medicine on the theme of preventative cardiology. To see the full lineup, visit our website, which Janet will put in the chat. Thanks, Janet. Or you can just search for GW Biomedical Cross Disciplinary Seminar Series. We are the only one, we will pop right up. So today we'll learn about plastics and cardiac health from Nikki Posnack, PhD. Dr. Posnack earned her Bachelor of Science in Chemistry from Washington College and her Doctorate in Pharmacology and Physiology from the George Washington University. She investigates the impact of environmental influences on cardiovascular function. Specifically, her, work, her recent work focused on how endocrine disrupting chemicals, which are used in the manufacturing of medical devices and consumer products, can alter cardiac, electric, and mechanical function. Dr. Posdex Laboratory collaborates on a number of clinically relevant projects that aim to improve patient outcomes following cardiac surgery and or transfusion procedures. Her laboratory utilizes a wide array of cardiovascular models, such as neonatal cardiac cells, human stem cell derived myocytes, whole hearts, in vivo radio telemetry, and imaging modalities, including confocal, optical mapping, hyperspectral, as well as phenotypic assays, like metabolic assays, gene expression arrays, and calcium voltage dyes. Whew, that's a lot. You are a very busy lab. <laughs> uh, Dr. Posnick's lab is part of the Children's National Heart Institute and the Sheikh Syed Institute for Pediatric Surgical Innovation. She's an assistant professor of pediatrics as well as pharmacology and physiology here at the George Washington University School of Medicine and Health Sciences. Please welcome one of our own, Nikki Posnack. Thanks, Dr. Frame. Um, I appreciate that very kind uh, introduction and um, thank you again for the invitation to speak today. Um, hopefully I'll get some good feedback and maybe this will open up some additional opportunities for collaboration either today or maybe after um, the, uh, the lecture series posts online. So kind of fitting with the goal of, of this seminar series, um, my, my ultimate goal today is really just to introduce you to this topic of plastics and its their potential impact on cardiac health. Um, and along the way, describe some of the recent work from my lab which is physically located at Children's National Hospital, but affiliated with the George Washington University. Okay, I'm gonna minimize you so I can see my own slides, sorry about that. <clears throat> okay, so, so plastics are really ubiquitous in our environment. I think you'd be hard pressed to, to go throughout your day today and not find a plastic material or a plastic product that you come into contact with. Uh, and so as a result, humans um, are exposed to synthetic chemicals that are used to manufacture plastic materials and, and plastic products. In fact, biomonitoring studies have shown that anywhere from 93 to 98% of the population, uh, this includes me and you, are exposed to these plastic chemicals and we have them circulating in our bodies uh, at any given time. So the problem with these plastic materials is that they don't simply disappear, right? So plastic products uh, degrade into smaller and smaller materials, which are called microplastics shown here. Um, and these microplastics can, can get into our uh, tap water supplies. And so most frequently, um, our contact with plastic materials and the way that our bodies are exposed to them comes through our diet as plastic products are used to store, collect, and process uh, food and beverages. In fact, it's estimated that the average person ingests approximately five grams of plastic per week, or roughly the size or weight of a credit card. So there are a number of different chemicals that are used to make plastic materials and plastic products that give it its inherent uh, properties, right? Depending on the color, um, the strength of the material, there's a lot of different combinations of additives that are used. So to date, my lab has, has really focused on two different classes of, of plastic chemicals, including phthalates and bisphenols. So phthalates are a type of chemical that's frequently used as an additive in plastic manufacturing. 
Uh, phthalates are often mixed with a more rigid uh, material like a PVC matrix. And the phthalate can then uh, intercalate in between the PVC matrix to make these types of plastic materials more flexible. So they really offer flexibility in the different types of materials. And they make up a considerable amount or weight of the final product. So they can, they can make up as much to 40 to 80% of the final product weight. Um, and the problem with these, these different chemicals that are used as additives is that they're not uh, covalently bound to that PVC matrix. So if this tubing comes into contact with a more favorable environment uh, or lithophilic environment, that, that plasticizer phthalate chemical will then leach out of the plastic product into patients possibly or into food samples or things that are being stored in the plastic material. So DHP is not only used, or phthalates are not only used um, in consumer products that, that we come into contact with, but they're also used in the medical field. Uh, so one of, the, one of the phthalates that we're most interested in is called DEHP, and it was first incorporated into medical products back in the 1950s. Um, when Dr. Carl Walter, uh, a surgeon and inventor, was looking for a better way to store and transport blood, which at the time was exclusively stored and transported in glass materials. So the second um, chemical group that we're interested in that I'll talk about today are bisphenols, and many of you have probably heard of BPA or seen stickers on materials that say BPA-free. So bisphenols are a little bit different. They're more commonly used as the actual building block to make these plastic materials. Um, so frequently you think about them um, as being used in more of those shatterproof polycarbonate plastics, while the phthalates are more used in the flexible, flexible materials. Uh, since BPA um, structurally resemble, resembles estradiol, it was actually first investigated uh, for medical use back in the 1930s as an artificial estrogen. And then it was later displaced by DES, which was more potent, had more potent estrogenic properties. But today, BPA and some of the other bisphenols are still used in a number of consumer products and medical devices. Um, as shown here, this includes those shatterproof materials, thinking about blood blood reservoirs or collection um, uh, cylinders. Uh, they're also used in dialysis membranes and hemoconcentrators. So today I'm just going to kind of group these phthalates and bisphenols into, into a broad plastic chemical uh, word or topic, but I think it's important to note that these two types of chemicals are actually used in a lot of different materials beyond plastics. Uh, so phthalates are, are commonly used as solubilizing agents in uh, personal care products. So pretty much any kind of shampoo or soap uh, that has a fragrance usually has some sort of phthalate material in it. Um, and bisphenols are also used as uh, resin liners in aluminum cans. Um, and they're also used in thermal printing applications. So if you think of receipt paper that you get from the store, often those are also um, used with BPA. So, so humans really have this kind of broad uh, different routes of exposure, right? We, we can come into contact with these materials through food, through water, uh, through dermal exposure by touching things, um, and even in our, you know, shampoos and personal care materials. So why do we care about these phthalate and bisphenol chemical exposures? Well, both of these um, groups of synthetic chemicals are classified as endocrine disruptors which essentially means that they can modify or uh, interfere with normal hormone homeostasis. So accordingly, much of the existing research literature has really been focused on how phthalates or bisphenols may be contributing to either reproductive or metabolic uh, disorders, which makes sense. Um, however, uh, epidemiological studies are continuing to accumulate and show that these chemicals are also associated with um, adverse cardiovascular outcomes. So I've shown here uh, just a couple of um, papers within, let's say, the last decade that are beginning to look at bisphenol and phthalate exposures and their impact on cardiac health, uh, but this list isn't exhaustive. Um, so both of these chemicals, um, through, through those daily kind of uh, routine exposures in the general population, have been linked to an increased risk of heart attack, uh, increased risk of hypertension. Um, so there's actually this famous CAN study where they had individuals drink uh, beverages out of aluminum cans that have those resin liners versus glass and show that just within a very acute period, you can have an increase in blood pressure following exposure to bisphenols. Um, increased risk of atherosclerosis, decreased risk of heart or decrease in heart rate variability. 
And uh, more recently, NYU has been doing a lot of work to look at the impact of these chemical exposures on uh, both cardiovascular and all-cause mortality. So I thought I would just, in the spirit of this topic on cardiovascular health, just kind of highlight two of these studies that came out within the last maybe year and a half, although this is not my specific area of interest or, or area of expertise. Um, but, but the work that's being done at NYU is, is pretty amazing, actually. They have a large number of adults that have been enrolled in these studies. Um, one study is close to 4,000, another over 5,000 individuals. And what they've done is they looked at those individuals who have um, either bisphenol or phthalate exposures, they divide them up into three different groups or tertiles, so people with low exposure, moderate, and high exposure. Um, and then they followed these individuals up for an average of 10 years and found that those individuals with higher background levels of phthalates and bisphenols in their blood or their urine um, have an increased risk of both all-cause and cardiovascular mortality by as much as 50% increased risk. So it's really kind of a significant um, association that's being investigated as this broad public health concern. And I should also point out uh, that these associations uh, stayed true even when they uh, adjusted for multiple um, confounding variables. So despite all of these concerns I've kind of talked about, uh, the FDA still considers bisphenols and phthalates as food additives. Um, and that's really because they come into our food and water supply inadvertently through, mostly through packaging. Um, now, I, I thought I would also, in the spirit of GW, kind of highlight this study that kind of got a lot of press uh, last year um, from former uh, GW faculty member, Dr. Zoda, which kind of looked at food samples and found that nearly 70 to 80 percent of food samples from fast food restaurants uh, actually contained phthalates. Um, so individuals, of course, have kind of pushed, pushed back on this and said maybe we should consider these as, as maybe a little bit more potent than just food additives, but still to date that's kind of the stance from the FDA. I will mention that phthalates have um, a couple of phthalates, not all, a couple of phthalates have been banned from uh, baby bottles and teething products because of concerns over heightened exposure in, in, in young infants. Um, and BPA has been discontinued from a, a, a number of those uh, infant products, may, mainly due to consumer backlash, not really because of mandates. The one exception to the FDA stance is they have provided guidance uh, recommending that phthalate medical devices uh, should be reduced or um, avoided if possible in high-risk neonatal boys due to some data showing that there's some reproductive toxicities. So clearly there are concerns about these kind of low-dose chronic exposures we have to these environmental toxins and how they may be impacting our health, either metabolic health, reproductive health, or cardiovascular health. But those are kind of low-dose chronic exposures. Um, one thing that our lab is, is really interested in is more of the uh, higher dose uh, medical device exposures that can occur, particularly in the intensive care setting. So as you can imagine, these really sensitive patient populations um, often have multiple medical interventions that use plastics. Uh, and as a result, it's estimated that their cumulative exposure can be thousands of fold higher than what's considered safe. Um, based on animal toxicity studies. So with that in mind, I, of course, I'm in a children's hospital. Um, so my lab is really kind of focused on how these patients come into contact with plastic materials. What could that, those impact of that heightened exposure be on, um, on their health outcomes or post-operative health outcomes? And we know um, that all of these patients are really heterogeneous, right? So they have underlying, different underlying health conditions. Their course of treatment is, is obviously different. Um, and so we probably will never be able to have a cause and effect relationship, knowing that this heightened exposure absolutely contributed to this outcome um, because it's more complex than that. Uh, so in order to try to give a little bit more insight into what these plastic chemical exposures are doing, um, our lab also uses a lot of experimental models, which I'll show today, where we can measure the direct effects of these chemical exposures on heart function. And then along the way, our, our ultimate goal really is to try to identify some possible uh, mitigation strategies where we might be able to reduce exposure or lessen exposure. Okay, so today I've kind of divided my talk up into two parts. Um, first, I'll just show some of our, our recent work on, on phthalates, those chemicals that are found in flexible plastic materials. 
So much of our work on phthalates to date has focused on one, one phthalate in particular called DEHP or di2-ethylhexyl phthalate. Um, it's one of the highest volume production chemicals and it's used uh, frequently to manufacture blood bags. Um, the problem with DEHP, as I mentioned, is it's not covalently bound within those flexible blood bags. And so it can leach into blood, into stored blood uh, during, it, during um, storage in the blood bank. And that's just shown here that these phthalate levels inside those blood bags increase over, um, over time. Now, DEHP is actually considered a lipophilic chemical, and it's thought that it can intercalate into red blood cell membranes, uh, which actually has a, um, a stabilizing effect. So blood that's stored in these bags containing DEHP, where the chemical leaks into the blood, uh, this blood actually stores better. The red blood cells stay healthy, and you can store them up to that 42-day uh, approved um, storage duration time. And so some of that data is just kind of shown here. This is an old table, but I think it kind of hits the point um, where you can see in, in bags that don't use, don't use these phthalates or these DEHP um, chemicals, uh, the rate of hemolysis or those red blood cells lysing is nearly double compared to, compared to blood that's stored in bags with DEHP. And actually, if you take that non-PVC bag and you just spike the plasticizer right into the bag, you can kind of recover um, and, and, and increase the health of those red blood cells and decrease the amount of lysis. And so there really hasn't been too much of a push to remove DHP from a lot of these blood bags or other medical devices because of these inadvertent um, positive effects that they see with blood storage and red blood cell stability. In fact, um, attempts to, uh, to, to develop some alternatives or replacement products, which are shown here, have largely been shown to be inferior. So bags, again, with DEHP, um, this, this phthalate plasticizer, have a decreased uh, uh, percentage of hemolysis as compared to those uh, possible replacement bags. So at least from our point of view, the, the likelihood that DHP will be removed from, from blood bags or, or medical devices is, is probably not anytime soon. And so therefore, it's pretty important to try to understand how these chemicals are, are impacting our patients. So first, I thought I'd show you some of our unpublished data um, on uh, chemical exposure here at Children's National. So for this study, uh, which is still kind of a work in progress, um, we wanted to quantify DHP or phthalic chemical exposure in cardiac patients. If we think about those, those cardiac patients, particularly cardiac surgery patients, um, they're often getting blood transfusions, and most of them are being put on cardiopulmonary bypass where there's a significant amount of tubing. And so for this study, we've divided our patients up into three groups. Um, first, we have our control patients who are undergoing surgery, but they don't require blood and they don't require um, support on a cardiopulmonary bypass circuit. Second, we have um, individuals who require surgery, but don't require this circulatory support with bypass. And then third, we have patients who require bypass and also require blood or blood products to prime the, the circuitry. So the key takeaway thus far from our study is that phthalates are detected uniformly in all of our patients. We didn't have any patients that were below the limit of detection. Um, but the difference across these different patient groups is quite substantial. So up here in black are those kind of control patients, those, those ones that don't require bypass, don't require blood products. Patients who require bypass are shown below. Again, we're looking at DHP, that main chemical that's found in those blood bags and tubing, as well as its um, subsequent metabolites. But then if we look at patients who require bypass and blood products, you can see that their levels are much higher, um, both uh, during surgery and following surgery. <laughs> So this is just kind of showing a side-by-side -side comparison of those different groups. Again, in black here, we have individuals who, who don't require bypass, those who do, and those who require bypass with blood. And you can see that those patients who require blood and, and uh, cardiopulmonary bypass support have much higher exposures. And to some degree, even after about 24 to 48 hours, their levels um, do remain higher than, than our control patients. <clears throat> so by... Uh, by large, um, the patients that had the highest exposure to these plastic chemicals were really our smallest patients who are less than one year old. Um, and there's a number of reasons for this. First, uh, these small patients often, almost 100% almost require blood. Um, and they also have an immature uh, metabolic system. So their ability to metabolize these, um, these contaminants and excrete them 
can take longer. And so we believe this is kind of why this, this smaller, younger patient cohort really has these higher exposures. So we wanted to figure out what does this mean? Does this have any potential impact on these patients? Um, and to do this, we, we started by kind of looking at the literature and seeing, well, in an animal model, what happens when these animals are exposed to phthalates? Um, and, and can we then guide, use that information to guide what we're looking at for post-operative complications? So in animals, what's seen in a rather um, short time frame is that if they're exposed to high levels of these phthalates, similar to what you would get in a blood bag, um, they uh, often have um, Cardi they often have heart rate slowing, uh, eventually resulting in cardiac arrest, and also hypotension where blood pressure decreases. And so for our post-operative outcomes, we focus just on those patients that are less than one year old. Um, and these patients um, often experience a number of those, uh, the, those outcomes that are observed in animal models. So in blue here, these are these patients that do have complications versus those that don't, and we're kind of looking at total phthalate exposure. Um, and so you can see patients who have uh, hypotension after surgery are more likely to have higher phthalate levels. Uh, they're more likely to have low cardiac output, so their heart isn't pumping as efficiently. Um, they can often experience either bradycardia, heart block, or even cardiac arrest. Uh, and then we also detect um, electrical disturbances. So these patients are more likely to exhibit uh, supraventricular tachycardia, junctional tachycardia, uh, ventricular tachycardia and fibrillation, or even premature ventricular contractions. So here's where I have to point out that, of course, this data is um, it's pilot data. We have about 120, 125 patients enrolled thus far. Um, we're hoping to continue these studies within the next year. But of course, we acknowledge that plastics are not the only contributor to these complications. Our goal is really just to understand whether there might be an association and whether we can really identify the direct effects of these chemicals using um, backing up some of this data with experimental models. So I thought I would segue into a little bit of the work that we're doing in the laboratory to kind of say, okay, we observe these complications in our patients. Um, is it possible that these chemical exposures are causing those complications? So to do this, our lab uses a number of different experimental models, and I'll just highlight a few today. Um, if you, if you look at the literature, uh, a couple phthalates are thought to interfere with um, biological systems in a couple of different ways that are relevant to the heart. Um, so one of those is phthalates have been shown to decrease the way that cells communicate between one another by decreasing these channels that are called gap junctions. So gap junctions are kind of like little tunnels in between neighboring cells that allow small molecules um, and, and signaling factors to go back and forth in between. And so those are, those are really important in the heart because you need to have um, uh, ions flowing in between neighboring cells very quickly in order for the heart to um, spread an electrical signal and have uniform contraction. And so phthalates have been shown to disrupt these channels or these gap junctions in a number of different cell types. Um, and some of those are listed here where it's thought that this disruption of gap junctions um, can lead to some of those reproductive toxicities that I mentioned um, occur in young boys. They've also been shown to uh, affect gap junctions in um, lung fibroblast, astrocytes, and hepatocytes, where it's thought to, to, to precipitate liver, liver tumors. And so there's a couple of different ways that phthalates may be impacting gap junctions. Um, first is physical disruption of the cell membrane. Um, as I mentioned, it's thought that phthalates may actually just get into the membrane of those red blood cells. And simulation studies suggest that phthalates do in fact embed and disrupt lipid membranes. So this could be similar to the effects of heptanol or fatty acids or other things that are gap junction on couplers. Alternatively, phthalates have been shown to increase oxidative stress, which also disrupts gap junctions between neighboring cells. And that's just shown here. Normal, under normal conditions versus oxidative stress conditions, you have more, more of these um, channels that are involved in gap junctions uh, found inside the cell where they're not in a functional location. So in addition to this, this increase in oxidative stress and effects on gap junctions, it's also thought that phthalates can interact with cholinergic receptors. Um, and so this would be something akin to acetylcholine, which, which would lead to cardiodepressive effects. So we found that acute exposure to phthalates actually increases oxidative stress. Um, and, and that's just shown here. 
uh, using human-induced pluripotent stem cell-derived cardiomyocytes. I'll just call them human cardiomyocytes because it's a long word to say. Um, so, so after about 30 minutes to an hour of exposure, we see this dramatic increase in oxidative stress. And then if we expose those cells to these chemicals for a little bit longer, we start to see these changes in connexin. Um, and that's just shown over here, where either we're looking at connexin expression in um, rodent cardiomyocytes or even those human cardiomyocytes. Ultimately, what we see is that connexin starts to be localized. Um, I'm sorry, connexin is a gap junction protein. Connexin or these gap junction proteins start to be found inside the cell versus on the cell membrane, where it's just not in a functional location. So next we wanted to say, okay, well, if we're affecting where these gap junctions are located, does that really have an impact, a functional consequence on these cell, cell phenotypes? And so to do that, we've used um, a methodology called fluorescence recovery after photobleaching, which is a pretty cool technique. Um, essentially, these cardiomyocytes are loaded with a very low molecular weight dye that can easily pass through those channels in between neighboring cells. Um, and then what we can do is we can bleach a single cell and measure how long it takes for that cell to recover its fluorescent properties. So if a cell is coupled to all of its neighbors through these channels, you would expect that you would get this increase in fluorescence recovery, which is then inhibited when you have these um, phthalate exposures most likely because those gap junction channels are becoming uncoupled. And in fact, this is what we observe when we use a known gap junction uncoupler heptanol. The effects are, are fairly similar. So next, we wanted to assess the, the functional consequences on cardiac, elect, cardiac conduction velocity. So maybe we don't have these gap junctions in place. Maybe it's affecting how well these cells are coupled, but does it affect the electrical properties of the cell? Um, so we've, we've kind of done some of these studies in two ways, both using human cardiomyocytes as well as intact um, whole heart models. So up here at the top, I'm just showing how these human cardiomyocytes are grown on top of a microelectrode array system. And what we can do is we can measure how quickly signals propagate across these electrodes, kind of simulating how quickly a, a signal would pass in the heart under control conditions and with increasing doses of these phthalate chemicals over increasing amounts of time. And so this color scale is just showing you how quickly or how slowly a signal is propagating, where the darker colors show that the signal is, is, is spreading across the cardiomyocytes uh, much, much slower um, than the control conditions. And the compiled data is just shown here. With increasing amounts of time and increasing doses, you can see that conduction velocity begins to slow. So in this bottom video, I'll just show you that some of this data has now been replicated in, in these isolated intact heart preparations. Um, so just to orient you, we do a lot of what's called optical mapping, where we, we load um, heart preparations with dyes that allow us to see the electrical activity within the heart. Um, so let's see if this works. But what you should see is you should see a signal propagating across the heart surface that's kind of color-coded similar to these microelectrode arrays um, so that you can see the direction of that signal. See, yeah, there you go. So what we see is that if we look at these, these, these intact heart preparations under baseline conditions or after exposure to phthalates, we have about a 50% reduction in conduction velocity. So we have conduction velocity slowing in our isolated hearts and our cell preparations. Um, and if these, if these cell preps are exposed for longer periods of time, now we're talking not just a few minutes to an hour, but maybe 48 hours or longer, Kind of what a patient might be exposed to if they're on ECMO, maybe prolonged circulatory support. Um, we see that these, these uh, cell preparations not only, stopped, not only stopped communicating with each other well, but in some cases just completely stopped talking to one another. So here we'll see um, in these control uh, cardiomyocyte preparations that these cells are really well coupled. So they're kind of all getting excited at the same time. Everyone's talking to one another, everyone's in synchrony. And this is kind of what you want from, from your heart, right? You want a signal to propagate very quickly within the heart tissue so that you have uniform contraction. But we get quite a different signal when we expose these preparations to, to these phthalates. You can see that these cells become uncoupled from one another and asynchronous. And some of that data, compiled data is just shown here. And in our intact heart preparations, we observe that uh, we have an increased risk of these arrhythmias, um, which kind of backs up some of the post-operative data that we see in our patients. So I also mentioned that phthalates may interact with muscarinic receptors, which can kind of um, increase the amount of, kind of 
arbitrarily or in a fake way increase the amount of parasympathetic tone, which can result in these cardiodepressive effects like cardiac arrest. So we wanted to see if we observe this in, uh, in our experimental animal models. And some of that data is just shown here, where in red, we have our control or our baseline um, ECG signals. And you can see that heart rate begins to slow quite quickly after phthalate exposure. Um, and that compiled data is, is shown here that with increasing amounts of time, these chemicals continue to have a cardiodepressive effect. Um, and we've also seen that uh, these phthalates directly suppress the, the um, the properties of the sinus node, which is the part of the heart that controls the rate. So similar to other known chemicals like acetylcholine that act on muscarinic receptors, we also observe significant delays in atrioventricular conduction. So this is just shown here in these time-lapse images. I'll just try to quickly orient you that this is the top of the heart or the atria, and down, down here are the ventricles. And so during the normal cardiac cycle, you have a signal that starts up at the atria, then propagates down to the ventricles, which then leads to contraction. So you can see here in these control preparations in red, uh, our peak activation time of our atria, which then progress down to the ventricles. And that timing is, is significant de significantly delayed in our phthalate exposed hearts. We can then follow the ECGs, like look at the ECG of some of these heart preparations, uh, we can see that we start to begin, begin to observe AV delay and then a complete AV coupling where we have second degree and even third degree heart block. And so currently the lab is now trying to figure out ways to take um, these projects to the next steps to really address human applicability. So our lab uh, is, um, uh, I, I won't say it's a good thing, but we happen to be in a children's hospital, <clears throat> which means we have the opportunity to collaborate with surgeons to collect actual human heart tissue from the operating room. So uh, we see about, not me, but the cardiac surgeons here see about 300 to, 40, 300 to 400 cardiac surgery patients per year. Um, these congenital heart defect patients are often um, undergoing some sort of surgical repair uh, to their heart. And during that repair procedure, sometimes pieces of the heart are removed. So we're not taking extra heart samples. We're just collaborating with them to, to collect tissue that's removed during the normal operation, but would normally be discarded. So we have the benefit of just going down a couple of, couple of floors to pick up this heart tissue. Uh, and then we can bring it up to the lab um, for uh, lab testing, essentially. So these live heart tissue preparations are transported to the lab. Um, we slice this tissue into very thin slices so that it doesn't go ischemic. Um, and then we maintain these tissue slices in an oxygenated media where we can then monitor either cardiac action potentials or calcium transients. Um, and so then as expected for some of these chemicals that are cardio, cardiodepressive and interact with muscarinic receptors, we've observed that phthalate exposure significantly impairs calcium handling, which impacts the contractile properties of the heart. Um, and this makes sense since we see this low cardiac output or myocardial stunning in some of these patients with high phthalate exposures. Um, notably, uh, most of these results that we see um, quickly wash out. So this is actually a good sign that those chemicals, um, their interactions may interact with those receptors to lead to cardiodepressive effects, but maybe within 48 hours, once those patients start to metabolize and excrete these chemicals, that some of those exposures and, and downstream effects um, can wash out or recover. And then finally, our, uh, at least for phthalates, some of the next steps that we're working on is trying to investigate possible mitigation strategies. Uh, one way that that can be done um, is, uh, is through a procedure that's called cell washing. So cell washing is sometimes done to remove um, extracellular, extracellular components from a stored uh, red blood cell bag before um, it's used for transfusion or, or particularly for cardiopulmonary bypass. The main goal of that is actually to remove lactate and high potassium that can accumulate in the blood bag. But what we found is that if you wash red blood cells, you also remove the phthalates, which appear to be to some degree accumulating in that extracellular environment. Second, we've observed um, that uh, using DHP free or some of these phthalate free bags, of course, reduces a, a patient's exposure. So roughly two to 5% of the bags that we receive here at Children's from the American Red Cross are these newer DHP-free bags, um, which do have less concentrations of phthalates. 
Uh, but I'll remind you that there are concerns over how well blood stores in these DHP-free bags for prolonged periods of time. Um, and there was actually a study uh, just this year surveying blood centers and whether they might be ready to move forward with using DHP-free bags. And to date, at least the consensus is not quite yet um, because they don't feel that they can store blood for that full 42 hours in these, D 42 days, sorry, in these DHP-free bags, um, which could lead to a blood shortage. So the goal is to try to find an in-between where we have maybe better biomaterials where blood still stays healthy and can still be stored for those longer periods of time. <laughs> okay, so switching gears, I thought I'd just briefly highlight some of our recent work on uh, bisphenol chemicals. And so again, these are like the harder, the materials that are used more in those harder polycarbonate shatterproof plastics. <laughs> so bisphenols, including BPA, um, is still commonly found in consumer and medical products, um, but alternatives like either BPF or BPS are now being incorporated as replacements for manufacturing. Um, so often you'll see these, these plastic water bottles that'll say BPA free. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're bisphenol free. That might mean they're BPA free, but they've been replaced with another bisphenol like BPS. So it's smart advertising. Um, and so we were kind of interested in whether these alternative replacement products uh, would be safer or whether they might have um, similar cardiotoxicity properties as the original BPA. So to start, we for, for some of these comparisons testing, um, we started uh, by taking this comprehensive in, in vitro proarrhythmia assay approach. And so this approach, uh, termed SIPA, um, essentially is used to test whether drugs may have um, cardiotoxic effects. So as you know, pharmaceutical Drugs, a number of them are pulled from market because they can be, um, uh, they can cause toxicity in the heart. And so this is an approach to look at whether drugs may impact different ion channels and then following up those ion channel studies using an integrated biological system. But we thought we don't have to use this approach just for drugs. Maybe we can also use it for these environmental toxins to see if one might be safer than another. So for this work, we partnered with um, Dr. Jason Shang, who's actually a former FDA scientist and now an entrepreneur who founded SIPA Labs, actually in Rockville, Maryland. And we talked to Jason about trying to understand these four main ion channels that are most commonly disrupted with cardiotoxic drugs to compare whether some of these alternatives might be safer. So first we measured the impact of bisphenol chemicals on peak and late sodium channel current. Um, and so just to orient you, this is what the, a, a typical um, human cardiac action potential looks like. Peak sodium current is really important in that first phase or that upstroke depolarization phase, while late sodium, sodium channel current occurs more during the plateau phase. And the key takeaway from, from these figures is that BPA, which is shown here in red on these inhibition curves, is shifted to the left, which essentially indicates that we get more inhibitory effects from BPA at lower doses as compared to either BPF or BPS. So, um, you know, from these initial studies, both looking at peak and late sodium channel current, one might expect that um, BPF and BPS might actually be safer compared to BPA. Next, we wanted to look at the impact of these bisphenol chemicals on voltage-gated calcium channels. So voltage-gated calcium channels are really important in nodal cells. Um, they contribute to the depolarization phase of the nodal action potential. Um, so that kind of helps to set the rate of the heart. Cal these calcium channels are also important in the plateau phase of the ventricular cardiomyocyte. And again, the key takeaway here is just that BPA is shifted to the left. And so we start to see inhibitory effects for both voltage-gated calcium channels as well as um, potassium channels that are important in this repolarization phase with BPA as compared to BPF or BPS. So we wanted to look at this, this impact or this effect on, on these voltage-gated calcium channels a little further um, because simulation studies uh, have suggested that the structure of the bis bisphenol chemical um, can influence how likely it is to interact with different, different ion channels, including those calcium channels. And so I'm just showing a figure here, um, which suggests that based on the side chains of this of BPA, um, looking at these side chains here between the phenol rings, uh, BPA is expected to be um, more potent as compared to BPF or BPS. And that's largely what we've seen so far in our ion channel studies. 
So with the caveat that anytime you do these, um, these, these ion channel measurements, these are using a, a cell type that's been transfected with one specific ion channel of interest. So it's always important to follow those studies up and validate them using an actual cardiac model. So our next goal was to validate some of these, these findings. Again, we went back to our human cardiomyocyte preparations. We grew these preparations onto these microelectrode arrays, and we measured um, these uh, local uh, electrical signals, which are called a field potential duration, which kind of mimics or is a surrogate for an action potential. And so if you recall, I said that those voltage-gated calcium channels are important for that plateau phase of the action potential. So if there's less calcium current coming in, we would expect the action potential duration to shorten. And this is actually what we see with BPA with increasing doses, our field potential duration or our action potential duration begins to shorten. Um, we see similar effects at high doses with BPF, but essentially no effect at all with this BPS replacement chemical. So next we wanted to validate um, some of these cell-based studies using an actual intact heart preparation. I kind of mentioned this before that those calcium channels are important for a number of different parts of the heart. In the nodal cell, it's important for setting the rate, um, whereas in the ventricular cardiomyocytes, it's, it's really important for the contractile properties. And so we wanted to kind of look at a whole 3D um, heart configuration instead of just a 2D cell model. So for these studies, essentially what we do is we, we, we take uh, an, use an experimental model, we remove the heart, we cannulate the aorta and we put it on this perfusion system to keep the heart alive, basically kind of like a bioreactor. We're, we're giving the heart all the nutrients, the salts, the, the energy products that it needs. We're keeping it well oxygenated, but we can actually measure the electrical signals from that heart preparation, either con under control conditions or following exposure to one of these bisphenol chemicals. <clears throat> So in nodal cells, I mentioned, again, those voltage-gated calcium channels are important for the upstroke or the depolarization phase, and they help to set the rate. Um, so first, we wanted to just look at what is the rate of the heart after exposure to these bisphenol chemicals. So again, if we're kind of looking at those ECGs with increasing doses of, of bisphenols, or particularly with BPA, we start to get heart rate slowing. Um, and this mostly occurs at higher doses. So this is in the micromolar range not a concentration that you're likely to be exposed to on an environmental, um, you know, from environmental uh, contact with plastics. But again, nevertheless, um, no effects at all uh, with, with that BPF chemical until we looked at the highest dose and no effects at all on heart rate with BPS. Back up one second. So those voltage-gated calcium channels are important for setting the rate, and they're also important for um, controlling how fast a signal propagates from the top of the heart at the atria down to the ventricle. So this is called AV conduction. And so we wanted to look at whether AV conduction was impacted um, from these bisphenol chemical exposures. And some of that work is just shown here, um, where essentially what we've done is we observe that AV slowing does occur under baseline conditions, but it actually gets a lot worse if we try to get the heart to beat or pace at faster rates. So think about your body at rest versus your body um, out running or, or undergoing some sort of exercise where your heart rate goes up. So we can kind of control the rate of the heart using external stimulation. And that's just shown here. Where at the bottom, these little S1s indicate uh, an electrical stimulus um, to the heart. And then the signal that follows is the response to the heart. So we can say, we're gonna pace the atria, does that signal propagate down to the ventricles under baseline conditions and with increasing concentrations of BPA exposure. And for these studies, what we found was even at relatively low concentrations in the nanomolar range, we start to see slowing of that AV conduction parameters. Um, again, not much changes with BPF until those higher doses and no changes at all with BPF. So voltage-gated calcium channels um, are also important for controlling the contractile properties of the heart. So in heart tissue, calcium channels play a role in coupling the electrical signal to contraction. And that's just shown here in this cartoon below, where if you have an action potential shown in black, this actually stimulates these voltage-gated calcium channels to open, which then triggers uh, calcium to dump from this internal storage compartment. And so we can follow how quickly that calcium signal goes up and comes back down as an indicator of the contractility of the cell uh, or the heart tissue. And some of that data is just shown here on the right, 
um, where we've actually used a, a probe that's put inside these cells that kind of um, that interacts with calcium. And we can see when calcium starts to accumulate, the fluorescence signal will go up. Uh, and then when calcium is resequestered, the signal then goes back down. So let's see if this plays. Okay, so these are our control muscle fibers. So you can see we have this fluorescence goes up, calcium gets released, the muscle contracts, calcium gets resequestered. Um, but following exposure to BPA, you can see that this process is severely inhibited. Um, so this, again, kind of just feeds back to the fact that BPA appears to be acting like a calcium channel blocker. It's affecting the AV, it's affecting how quickly a signal propagates from the atria down to the ventricle, and it's impacting calcium handling and contractility. <clears throat> so finally, we wanted to measure the, the actual impact of bisphenol exposure on mechanical function of the heart, again, using these intact heart preparations. So for these studies, what we do is we, we take a balloon, a small balloon, and insert it down into the left ventricular space of the heart. Uh, and then we can monitor the amount of pressure that's, that's pushing on that balloon as the heart contracts. And some of that data is just shown here. We're in response to pacing. We have these really nice pressure waves under control conditions. And the developed pressure then begins to decrease um, at even very low nanomolar concentrations of BPA. Um, we haven't been able to finish these studies yet, uh, looking at those bisphenol alternatives, but based on our pilot data that I've shown you so far, um, it, we do believe that these uh, bisphenol alternatives will prove to be a safer alternative as compared to BPA. So similar to, similar to those phthalate studies, we do have additional steps to do and more work to do. Um, so one thing that we're working on is, of course, translating this to in vivo. Um, we want to see not only what do these chemicals do on cell preparations or isolated hearts, but what happens at the whole body level. Um, so some of that pilot data is shown here. And one thing that I want to point out is um, environmental exposure to these bisphenols usually occur through our diet. So we have oral exposure to these chemicals. But patients, particularly our patients receiving blood transfusions or undergoing bypass, are more likely to have intravenous, blood, intravenous exposure, which results in much higher circulating levels of these bisphenols. And so what we're doing is we're, we're just using those numbers to actually see, do we get this uh, slowing of our PR interval, slowing of our AV conduction, eventually resulting in cardiac arrest in our, um, in our animal models. And then finally, we're look, using our human cardiomyocytes to investigate potential mechanisms, additional underlying mechanisms, which may help us to maybe revert or reverse some of those effects that bisphenols have. Today, I've mostly talked about the effects of BPA on calcium channels, um, but there's a, a good deal of literature that suggests that BPA actually interacts um, through estrogen receptors. Uh, and so this is another area of investigation that we're interested in and whether these bisphenol chemicals may have um, effects that are sex specific. Maybe they're in, impacting females to a greater extent versus males through these multiple different signaling pathways. Okay, and so I wanted to make sure I ended with plenty of time to thank everyone, uh, both uh, current members as well as, as prior members of the research lab um, who have done all of the work that I've described today. I usually get to write papers and, and write grants. I don't get to do a whole lot of basic research anymore. Um, so just going from left to right, Dr. Uh, Anisha um, is in our lab who finished from the BME department at George Washington University. Uh, Blake Cooper is a GW PhD student in the Institute of Biomedical Sciences who actually has a um, predoctoral fellowship looking at bisphenol chemicals in males versus females. Luke Swift is a PhD uh, alumni from GW, who's a staff scientist in my lab, does a lot of the isolated whole heart work. Myself, Devin Gorelli, is a PhD student in the GW BME department, who does all of our um, patient, uh, um, uh, collects all of our patient samples from the OR. Uh, Jenna Pressman is also a master's student at GW in the BME department, and Kazi Hawk is not a GW <laughs> alumni, he's probably the only one. Um, and then again, uh, all of the collaborators, both here at Children's as well as um, our cardiac surgical collaborators uh, for all of their assistance um, with this work. So I'll stop there and take any questions. 
Wow, thank you so much. That was a wonderful presentation and some really rigorous and elegant research. So congratulations to everyone on that suite of research. I know how long that took you to produce. <laughs> I think you don't, don't realize how long one figure can take to produce. So that's very impressive. Um, and as the moderator, I'm going to take the moder moderator's prerogative and give the first question. But while I'm doing that, please feel free to put your question in the chat or raise your hand and then you, you can unmute when I call on you. Uh, so my question was just real simple. Uh, what animal model was used in the isolated heart experiments? Okay, yeah, thanks for that. Um, so for the existing data that I showed today, let me see if that's true. Um, all of those studies were done in rat heart preparations. Um, so we use a lot of rodent heart preparations. Currently, Blake, um, one of the PhD students is working on a, a guinea pig model because the guinea pig cardiac electrophysiology um, profile uh, is more similar to a human. So she's working on some of those studies now. Wonderful, we'll look forward to hearing about those. Yeah, I'm, I, I'm excited for when her work comes out too. <laughs> Wonderful, yeah, this is great. Any questions? I feel like it, there are almost so many questions you can ask. People may be overwhelmed, uh, but feel free to just put them in the chat or raise your hand or, you know, just unmute. We're a small enough group right now that you can do that. Yeah, so I, I'll just say one of the things that people usually ask me is how they can avoid plastic chemical exposure. Good um, question. So uh, unless someone else has another question, I'll just kind of mention that um, often those, you can kind of look at those recycling codes. I believe it's threes and sevens that have bisphenol or phthalates in them. Um, and so really the most common environmental, again, environmental low dose is different than clinical high dose exposure, but really from those low dose exposures, um, trying to elim eliminate or reduce um, your contact with plastics, particularly like storing and microwaving because microwaving plastics increases the leaching or the migration out of the plastic. So just trying to reduce how much you use plastics for food and, and particularly microwaving things. If it looks like it's beat up and your Tupperware is like really trash, just get rid of it and, and get a new set. Wonderful, I love it. They actually did a campaign about not microwaving and plastic at um, the Hopkins School of Public Health when I was there. And I thought that was such a great little tip because it's, you know, you just switch it out for either a different plastic that's a lower, risk or, you know, better yet, a silicone or a, a glass, glass that's going to be non-reactive. Yeah, Hopkins has a really good environmental group that's done some of those exposure studies. I mentioned one of their one of their studies earlier for the NICU, NICU patients. Yeah, so I guess that's that's a question I can have in follow up is, OK, you're, you're having a baby. You obviously didn't plan for your baby to be in the NICU, but your baby is in the NICU. Is there anything we can do now? Should we even bother worrying about this or we're just not there yet? Um, I mean, I, I think I always try to maybe I didn't set the tone correctly today, but usually trying to walk it back from your child needs care. That's most Im important. I think the goal for environmental science really is just could we do it a little bit better. Um, so that that's kind of the goal that that we're trying to, to figure out is are there ways, you know, because there are alternatives that are being developed. Um, the, the goal is to get those alternatives incorporated into hospitals. Often they cost a lot more. Um, so at, at Children's, for example, a lot of our bypass circuits are actually lined with um, can be lined with heparin or other bioactive liners that reduce chemical exposure. I believe that's why a lot of our patients we see the effects with blood, but not so much bypass. But um, often those circuits are maybe eight to 10 times more expensive. And so not only just trying to incentivize manufacturers to make alternatives, but then finding ways to explain that those are important alternatives to, to adopt. Um, and there's also been a big push by nurses. Nurses are fantastic. So I've seen a lot of editorial and review articles from, from large nursing groups that say like, let's try to get our NICU phthalate free. Um, and so I think I think people are, are starting to realize that that's kind of important, particularly for those neonatal boys with reproductive concerns. Um, and so hopefully, you know, just accumulating evidence starts to push us in that direction. Mm -hmm. And I imagine that payers are also um, an issue here. It, is, is this covered, that additional cost covered by insurance typically or no? What's that? Is the additional cost covered by insurance or is that something that the uh, hospital yeah, so, is bearing? So at you, as a patient, you don't really have that option, right? But whoever orders your supplies, they can decide like, we're going to buy X number of cases of this circuit tubing, right? Um, and so it's more of a, 
supply demand issue. I know from the Red Cross, um, it's more of a supply demand cost issue, right? So if you if you have bags that are not as expensive and you can you can kind of use more of those, then it makes it makes sense from a cost perspective. But that's more the more on the institutional scale, less so on the patient scale. That makes sense. So I guess what is next? Uh, obviously, we're looking forward to the the guinea pig heart model, but what <laughs> what is coming after that? Uh, yeah. So I think. Um, uh, Hopefully, like some of the, I, a lot of the data I showed today is actually not published yet. So one of the findings we're hoping to get out is the, the patient cardiopulmonary bypass exposure data. Um, Devin Borelli has been working on that a lot for her PhD dissertation. It took a long time to get that many patients enrolled in, in that many samples um, analyzed. And so we hope that provides a lot of information for cardiac surgeons about this possible extra factor that might be contributing to, to patient outcomes. And then people can take it from there, whether they want to follow up on that or not. Um, so that's the first thing. And then the second thing is really trying to get some of this experimental model work done, looking at bisphenol alternatives. So when we started that project, um, I had every intention that BPF and BPS were going to be just as bad. And we were going to get another grant on how bad these alternatives were. <laughs> Um, and we were pleasantly surprised. Um, I, I don't know if that applies to all organ systems. I can only talk about the heart, um, but it was a little bit unexpected, but also that's a good thing that maybe just slight changes in chemical structures um, may reduce how these, how these chemicals um, interact with ion channels and affect heart health. So in some ways, it's a good and a bad thing, right? You think you're on to this next new topic, but it, it actually has proven to be a little bit safer, which, you know, should be good for everyone. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for that. Um, I have to say that we're going to have to get you on the GW Integrative Medicine podcast because this <laughs> is a topic people would love to hear about. Um, and maybe when you get that guinea pig heart model and we have a little bit more of new data, um, we'll Will you reach out to me, please, and let me know? Yeah, sure, sure. And I'll, I'll rope some of the others into it, too, if they want to, you know, give some input. That sounds wonderful. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us and for that wonderful presentation. Okay. Thanks, Dr. Frame. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Bye, everyone. Thank you for joining us.